Welcome back, everyone, to the Sitra Podcast, your forward operations base for all things military historical wargaming. I'm your host, Ariskany Jim, and today we are going back to the Eastern Front in World War II using Mark Ritchie's tactical combat system in 15mm. The campaign that we're featuring today in particular is Operation Barbarossa, the initial Axis invasion into the former Soviet Union right at the outset of the war along the Eastern Front. Needless to say, across the entire breadth of this absolutely gigantic front, huge battles immediately kicked off of absolutely insane scale and apocalyptic intensity. But the biggest ones took place in the south. The Southern German Army Group was commanded by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, spearheaded by the largest single panzer formation the German Army had at the time, Panzer Group 1 under command of Colonel General Ewald von Kleist. Now, although Army Group South was the largest of the three Axis Army Groups going into the Soviet Union, it wasn't necessarily the strongest, at least in certain categories. And perhaps most importantly, Army Group South was going up against much tougher initial Soviet resistance. Down here, the main Soviet military command was the Southwestern Front under the leadership of Marshal Mikhail Karponos, probably the best Soviet Marshal in direct frontal command at this time. He also had some excellent subordinate commanders under him, guys like Rokozovsky and Katakov. These Soviet generals almost immediately identified Army Group South's main thrust and came up with a proactive plan to contain its advance and then stop it. In very broad strokes, what they're going to do is they're going to throw the 22nd Mechanized Corps at the spearhead of Kleist's Panzer Group 1, stop it or maybe even slow it down a little, and then catch it in a pincer with 5th Soviet Army coming down from the north and 6th Soviet Army coming up from the south. Needless to say, this maneuver is going to trigger a tank battle of absurd proportions. From the north, with 5th Army, you have the 5th, 9th, and 19th Mechanized Corps. Again, you've got 22nd Mechanized Corps in that frontal blocking position. And from the south, with 6th Army, you're going to have the 4th, 8th, and 15th Mechanized Corps. Altogether, this includes 12 Soviet tank divisions, along with all kinds of motor rifle support, artillery, God knows what else. They're going to be attacking Kleist Panzer Group 1 from three directions, no less, and this German force includes a total of 13 divisions, five of them Panzer divisions, two of them motorized. Now here comes the problem for the Soviets. This kind of operation requires a little something we like to call battlefield coordination. This kind of plan only works when all of these converging units all hit at once. And uh, suffice it to say, they don't exactly. The joke I sometimes use is that Kleist Panzer Group is like Bruce Lee in one of those old school kung fu movies. The enemies surround him and then pay him the very polite courtesy of attacking him one at a time. And therefore, Kleist Panzers are able to concentrate and destroy each of these Soviet counterattacks in turn. One of these battles is going to be the subject for today's tabletop war game where elements of the Soviet 34th Tank Division, 8th Mechanized Corps, is getting ready to counterattack against the Germans, and instead the Germans counter-counterattack them first. Specifically, this is 15th Panzer Regiment of 11th Panzer Division. Now, when Mark showed me his scenario sheet with what he had planned, I quickly realized why he chose this particular engagement for his tabletop. Soviet 34th Tank Division is one of the very few Soviet tank divisions that fielded large numbers of the T-35 tank. This thing is just a horrible glory. It's, it's an atrocious tank. Let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. But it's fun to build, fun to paint, it's fun to put on your table. Good God, what a monstrosity. This thing had five separate turrets. Two with machine guns, two with 45 millimeter anti-tank guns. And just for fun, they stuck one little more on top with a 76 millimeter low velocity howitzer gun. Uh, it weighed 45 tons, which in 1941 is just insane and it had a crew of 11. This thing literally has a broadside off the port and starboard beams. You move this thing like a heavy cruiser. I don't know who was drinking what, I don't know who was smoking what, I don't know if someone was dying of the Spanish flu and they created a tank in the midst of their fever dream. I can't account for this monstrosity. Speaking of monstrosity, that's why I'm wearing this Godzilla shirt. It's in honor of our T-35s we're gonna have on today's table. They're huge, they're green, they're scary, they're awesome. But if you think about them for more than five consecutive seconds, it doesn't make a lick of sense. Now I'm playing the Soviets today, and I'm gonna have not one, but two of these beasts on the table, along with a whole swarm of T-26s, some small flamethrowing tanks, all other kinds of fun, light, small, early war stuff. 
Uh, I'm going to be up against a pretty nasty German force, though. Let's go to the footage and see if I can pull one out here for Mother Russia. Here is the table for today's game, 8 feet by 6 feet. We are looking generally out of the southwest into the northeast. And my Soviet forces are going to be setting up in a defensive position on the left-hand side of the table. I realize this sounds kind of backwards in the larger context of the Soviet front. The Soviets setting up in the west and the Germans coming at me from the east. But you got to remember, 8th Mechanized Corps and by extension 34th Tank Division was more or less behind the main body of Panzer Group Kleist at the outset of this battle. So here are some of the forces that we have. I've got a very small 76mm gun on the back of a truck. There is one of my absolutely glorious T-35s. Um, man, those things are equal parts atrocious and beautiful at the same time. So, yeah, what can I say? I got some Soviet infantry in the back of trucks. You see here where I'm sort of fiddling around with some buildings. I do obviously make a mistake here. I'm going to fix that later on in the game. You'll see that building move back where it's supposed to. Apologies for that. I should also mention that some of these miniatures are mine and some of them are built and painted by Mark Ritchie. And by and large, I'm on defense. I'm holding this village and I'm holding this road and that railroad and I have to hold it against a German attack coming at me. The German forces include this uh, light observation aircraft. Actually, I think it was a liaison aircraft. It's a Storch. Uh, one of uh, Mark's great miniatures he completed just in time for this game. And now, heading over to the other side of the table, we're looking at some of the German tanks coming at me. There's a plus two commander in what looks like a Mark III G. Here's one of the earlier uh, Panzerkampfwagen Mark III's. Uh, I think that's an E variant. There's a G variant with a uh, radio antenna on the back of it, that little frame structure on the back. And uh, of course, some Mark IVs. Uh, those are definitely ominous tanks especially for my infantry. Note that these are going to be Mark IVs, the earlier Mark IVs, I'm pretty sure offspring E's, with the short L24 75mm assault howitzer. So like I said, the Germans are coming in from the northeast, I'm trying to hold to the southwest, and hey, let's see what happens. I'll tell you one thing, it certainly doesn't take long for this battle to get started. We see here some of my T26s, along with my T35, that big beast in the background, and these really small tanks are tiny little OT-133 flamethrowing tanks. Uh, the lighter green tanks, those are mine, and the ones that are a darker green with some of the camouflage striping, those belong to Mark. I should say that I'm up against uh, Ron and Mark. They are dividing the German force and trying to come at me. They're coming at me in two basic axes right now. Ron's force is coming right down that road, and Mark's force is trying to turn my right wing there along the south. Their objective is to break off along this road. They have to get at least four armored vehicles off my side of the table within 18 inches of that central brown road there. So at the moment, my forces are pretty much divided into two basic order groups. Uh, everything that I already have on the table is in reaction fire. You see all those little purple tokens next to my counters? That's pretty much they're in overwatch, they're waiting for the enemy to move, and they get to shoot right away during the enemy's movement step. Meanwhile, I'm bringing on tons of reinforcements. So apparently 34th Tank Division uh, is just now getting the word that the Germans are on their way and they're rushing all kinds of reinforcements too. Which is a good thing because the Germans are, man, they're gonna hit me pretty hard here. You see where I've gotten a few very lucky hits. At this range, I have to hit with basically a one, maybe a two on a 20 sided dice. Luckily for me, I have actually scored one hit, one penetration, you see one Panzer is already burning there, and I have disabled a second one. I haven't killed him, but he's not getting off the table. So good news for me, he's not going to count towards German victory conditions. Bad news, he's providing fire support. Again, here we see that Storch liaison aircraft. What Mark's using it for here is an observation plane to call in all kinds of offboard artillery. Uh, at the moment, I'm not doing so bad. I'm holding. I've got that road more or less choked off. I've got one of my big T-35s. I mean, they're, they're, it's very clear where they are. They're absolutely gigantic tanks uh, on either shoulder of the road. Now, there are some special rules in this scenario about how the T-35s work. Because they're so huge, they have five individual independent turrets. It takes multiple hits to actually knock one of these things out. So you see where one gun has been knocked out, that's the red button there, and the yellow button indicates the vehicle's been immobilized. He already has all kinds of problems. 
the price for defending glorious Mother Russia will be steep and bloody. So we see here two of my T26 light tanks have now been hit and burning. Not so happy about that. Interesting little tank, the T26. Uh, surprisingly good for the time with its 45 millimeter gun. Cut its teeth in the Spanish Civil War in Finland. Here at Barbarossa though, they're not doing so good. The Germans have a mix of Mark III's with the old 3.7 centimeter gun and the somewhat short L42, I believe, five centimeter anti-tank gun on some of the newer, I think, G model uh, Mark III's. By no means the best, but uh, against 1941 Soviet armor, you don't really need the best. Notice there are no T-34s in my force. There are no KV-1s. Yes, these tanks were operational in Barbarossa 1941, but this early in the campaign, they were very, very rare. On this battlefield, I'm gonna have to make do with what I've got. Looking here at some of Mark's little battle group, he is coming at me with some of his lighter armor. The two machine guns on his Panzerkampfwagen Mark I has been firing up some of my infantry. Now the way it works is you kind of target the building when you have infantry in buildings. Uh, it's easy to hit the building, but then you don't get to choose exactly which men you hit. So some of the men in there are leaders or officers, some of them are already wounded, those are the little red counters. So it gets a little randomized after that. Meanwhile, the Mark II is going to fire his two centimeter auto cannon. I think he's shooting at my infantry as well. Oh, no, wait, Mark is going to change his mind and he's going to engage one of my T-35s. So the blue dice is the first shot, the red dice is the second shot. The red dice has a slightly better chance because, again, it's a little bit later. The target is considered acquired. Pretty much this simulates the gunner walking his auto cannon rounds onto the target. So we're checking the math here because that first shot was pretty close. Uh, turns out A7 does qualify as a hit because I'm not moving. And surprise, surprise, uh, the T-35 counts as a very large target. So he gets a plus two modifier for that. He does have a line of sight sort of caddy cording his way through two of those buildings. This is, by the way, the other T-35. So at the moment, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm confused about which one he's shooting at. But, oh, well, it was the one he was shooting at, and he has successfully knocked out one of my 45 anti tank guns. Mark is now angling for another shot with another one of his Mark IIs against my first T-35 there in the center of frame. I won't lie, at this point of the game, I wasn't terribly optimistic about my chances. You see here, obviously, my heaviest units are already taking significant damage, and I have to hold him from breaking, again, at least four armored vehicles off of my edge of the table within 18 inches of that road by the end of turn 12. We're not even through turn five yet. So the game's not even half over. He's already crossed more than half the table and he's got my guys under uh, some pretty devastating fire. So again, it's gonna be two shots because the Mark II, the Panzerkampfwagen Mark II has a two centimeter auto cannon. The first one is going to be kind of a ranging shot. The second one gets a little bit of a better shot. He uh, is not going to assess the plus two modifier for my very large size because his tank can only see part of mine around the corner of that building. And uh, he has moved and that's going to assess a negative two penalty on him as well. Nevertheless, um, he's going to go ahead and take his shots. And then once he does, uh, only one of his auto cannon shots hit. And then once he does, man, he rolls a one for damage, which is the best possible roll. He smokes the tank. Now, the way the T-35s work is basically you have to kill them twice because of their sheer bulk. But one of those kills has now been scored. That tank's in real trouble. I'll say this much, if you're playing the Soviets in 1941 Barbarossa and you don't feel desperate, you're probably not doing it right. So we're now on turn six, the game is officially half over and the Germans are more than halfway to their goals. They've now smoked that first T-35 twice. It's now full, complete, official dead. My second T-35 is in hardly any better shape. You see where all the forward guns have been knocked out. So in order to get any kind of firepower applied against the Germans, I have to trundle his fat ass out into the street, turn him sideways. Right after that, that yellow button was then hit and now immobilized. That's fine. Go ahead and wail on him the whole live long day. He is parked right across that road. Good luck getting around that 45 ton roadblock. But again, me, I wasn't kidding in the introduction when I said you have to use that tank almost like a warship. I'm basically presenting a port broadside and trying to fire my aft gun turrets 
I mean, what game are we playing right now? Is this Barbarossa or Jutland? With the T-35s, you're never really sure. But yeah, a lot more of my Soviet tanks are now on fire. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my mortar here. Again, you have to use mortars against tanks. You know you're getting desperate. To hit a tank with a mortar is pretty much impossible. This is way before sub munitions or anything like that. Maybe a smoke screen to sort of slow down the German fire. Let's see what I can uh, get done here. Soviet losses continue to compound, especially as Mark's battle group gets way too close to my right wing here. You see where I got lucky and smoked one of his Panzer Mark IIs. Meanwhile, my flamethrowing tank is stuck behind that wall, ready for a point-blank flamethrower shot. Let's face it, flamethrowers really only work at point-blank range. I've got two of my machine gun armed T-26s flanking my T-35 there. The Germans are welcome to go ahead and wail on that thing till the cows come home, knock it out. Good luck getting around that roadblock. It's kind of a cheesy tactic, but I've got to do everything I can to eat up a clock. At least now, Ron's tanks are going to have to flank around that obstacle in order to get their victory conditions. If it sounds like I'm playing the Soviets very ruthlessly, very callously, well, yeah, I'm playing a Soviet tank division in 1941. Zarada, new mother**** what else am I supposed to do? So we're now, again, uh, entering turn 7. I gotta get last until turn 12. Let's see if I can pull it off. We're on turn 10. We're really getting close here. Unfortunately for my Soviet forces, I'm pretty sure the Germans have inflicted enough damage on me to where I don't really have a whole heck of a lot left with which to stop them or even slow them down. You see where I'm dividing this smoke marker here to indicate that, yep, there it goes. My last T26 has now been smoked. I have a flamethrowing tank left that has shot a jet of fire into my cornfield there, hit that German half-track. Somehow I killed everyone in the vehicle except the driver. So now there's probably a crazed German driver running that burning clown car through my crops. Much more dangerous, however, is Ron's battle group over here on my left. All those uh, tanks parked there on the tracks. Now, on this part of the battlefield, I started to do a lot better. The way the to hit numbers work in tactical combat, especially short-barreled guns, which this scenario um, imposes on all the Soviet guns, you start off with like a five base to hit, and then after all my modifiers, it's basically a one or a two. But very quickly, that climbs to a 12. Pretty soon, I was scoring pretty good hits. Then my dice went cold here in the last turn or two, and even with my much better uh, chances to hit, I, I'm not doing so well. So he's very close to the edge of the table now. Again, he's got to break off anywhere within 18 inches of that uh, central road. Um, I'm pretty sure the Germans have probably squeaked out a win on this one. Turn 11, and this game is coming down to the absolute wire. This finish, guys, is going to be razor close. So let's go through everything very carefully and discuss what happens. My flamethrowing tank gets a very lucky hit, finishes off that half-track. My tankette collides with the German command tank. Who cares? That doesn't matter. Just having fun. That half-track is probably going to make it off the table. He does count as an armored vehicle. So, of course, does that Mark III and that Mark IV and the other Mark III further back on the railroad tracks. The German victory conditions require them to get four armored vehicles, not necessarily tanks, four armored vehicles off my end of the table within 18 inches of that central road there. So, yeah, this is going to get very, very close. My one real hope here is that some of my last remaining T26s, yes, I misspoke earlier, though I do have some T26s left on the table. They just weren't on that part of the battlefield. So you see here where I'm putting them in react fire. Again, my only real hope here is that as the Germans make that last rush and break off the end of the table, they're gonna cross some open killing ground. I might be able to get some reaction fire into their flank armor and maybe knock out one or two. Um, it's, it's gonna be very, very close. I'm gonna have to score a lot of hits here and either get immobilizations or outright kills. So first of all, this T-26 is going to engage that short-barreled Mark IV there. I barely have a line of sight, pretty much over the train platform there. Eight, that is a hit. Once again, we're very close range, so my chances to hit have gone way up. Thirteen, that indicates a hit on the hull armor. Unfortunately, his hull armor is E, and my tank gun, my 45mm anti-tank gun, only has D penetration. So, 
I have a chance, but oof, not with that roll. Both rolls are good at this game. 17 against my armor that's stronger than my gun. Yeah, that does uh, pretty much, you know, fuck all. All right, maybe I'll get better luck with this guy. Uh, another T26 is going to take a shot on that Mark III. Um, three, that's definitely another hit. Very good. Let's see where it hits on the enemy vehicle. Another 13, again, that indicates a hull hit. The good news is that the Mark III has armor of C, and again, I'm shooting with D. So now my gun is stronger than the um, enemy's armor. Let's see, oh God, with a one, no matter what. Okay, so that Mark III is smoked. The irony here is that it doesn't matter because he wasn't breaking up the game when he was too far away. So it feels good to kill a German tank, but in victory conditions, it doesn't matter. Meanwhile, this other T-26 is going to turn his turret and draw a bead on that half-track before he makes it off the table. So we're calculating the chances to hit and we're going to very quickly um, re-verify the range because it's right near one of the brackets. Okay, so I'm definitely over 25 centimeters there. It also looks like I'm kind of shooting through my own wagon unit there. I apologize for that. What's really happening here is, again, you see that purple react marker. I'm going to shoot as the half track is moving. So as the half track heads off the edge of the table, I'm gonna take a shot at him there. I probably should have filmed it a little bit different. It doesn't matter because I missed anyway. All right, so that half track is free and clear. There is nothing else I have that is gonna be able to stop him. Meanwhile, that Mark IV is gonna take a shot at my flank. Believe it or not, he actually misses. Not that it really matters. All right, so again, that half track definitely makes it. Next, we're gonna see if that Mark I command tank makes it off the table. This is a very, very close measurement. We gotta be really careful here because again, not only does he have to make it off the table this turn, but he's gonna have to make it off the table within 18 inches of the center of that road. So uh, we measured a couple times, we make extra sure, and believe it or not, yeah, he is gonna make it. So again, it's not German tanks, it's German armored vehicles. Four German armored vehicles got to make it off that road. Meanwhile, I'm checking my other tanks. I got nothing else I can contest Mark's move here against my right flank on the southern end of the table. Yeah, that half track and that uh, Befehlswagen, uh, Panzerwagen, is going to make it off. So it comes down to whether or not Ron here can get his stuff off the table. That lead Mark uh, three tank with the red button on his nose, he's damaged. He has no main gun. It doesn't matter if the tank is damaged or not. He's got, you know, he's an operational panzer. He makes it off the table with no problem. It's just whether or not that follow-on tank makes it off the table. And after several pretty close measurements and re-verifications, again, especially since he has to angle to the south to get within 18 inches of that central road you see there, he is going to not make it by like half an inch or like an, an, an inch. It's gonna come down very, very close. So there's three German tanks off the table, one of them damaged, although that doesn't really matter. That other Mark IV that shot at my T26, if he had not shot, uh, he still wouldn't have been able to make it. So we try a couple different ways to see if we can get this game into a draw. Uh, you see there where Ron's tank barely is hanging on there to the railroad track. And um, yeah, believe it or not, the Soviets walk away with a win on this one. Um, I successfully ran out the clock and just barely managed to uh, prevent German victory conditions. Soviet casualties are irrelevant. Yeah, man, we're the Soviet Union in 1941. Of course, they're irrelevant. So, hey, Tsar Radonu, we actually walked away with a win on this one. Well, glorious comrades, they don't come much closer than that. I swear, I think that game came down to about half an inch, especially over where Ron's breakthrough tanks were almost off the table by those railroad tracks. But one thing that I definitely noticed about this scenario, and I really appreciate it, was how Soviet tank guns started off so ineffective at longer ranges and yet became much more deadly the closer the Germans got. At those initial engagement ranges, I think I had to roll like a one or a two on a 20-sided dice, but then when the Germans began to close the range, Soviet tank guns became a lot more deadly. This is a story that you're going to see repeated over and over and over again throughout the entire history of the Eastern Front. And even nowadays in modern combat, if you're playing the Germans, the Americans, the British, in Europe against any kind of Soviet-equipped force, if you're playing the Israelis against the Soviet-equipped, say, Egyptian or Syrian army during the Arab-Israeli conflicts, man, engage them at a distance. Because once the Soviets get within a certain range, their guns hit just as hard as yours, and then their numbers really start to stack up. 
that's going to wrap us up today for another episode of the sit rep podcast please remember to like comment and subscribe if you enjoyed this content please remember to hit that notification bell and also consider joining our discord there is an auto accept invitation to our discord in the description of this video so come by see what the rest of the community is doing and hey show us what you're up to on the table as well Meanwhile, this is A Risk in the Gym with the Sit Rep Podcast. We are rounds complete for another episode. And as always, Tango Mike for watching.